Thank you, Hilary, for, for leading uh, this morning. I can hear an echo. Thank, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Pete. So shall we pray? Almighty God in heaven, we do thank you for this opportunity uh, to meet one with each other, but above all, to meet together in your presence. So Lord God, we pray that you will speak to each one of us this morning. May we know your presence. May you speak through Nehemiah 9. And that when we leave later on today, we can look back and say, God has spoken. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen and amen. So we're going through the, um, the book of Nehemiah. We're at Nehemiah 9. So to recap, it feels as if we've been going through Nehemiah for, for years, but it's not been years. Uh, the building work has now been achieved. The wall is done. Um, the opposition that tried to prevent the work happening didn't derail the work of God. And all the people in Nehemiah, um, we find, are working together with different giftings different abilities, different ages, and they're collaborating together, collaboration together, and we find the wall finished. Isn't that similar to the church? We've all got different giftings here. We've all got our, our different age groups. I'm not going to ask people how old each person is, because that may uh, not be what people would want to give their age groups. And here we find Nehemiah, in chapter 9, the, the Bible is being read and it's going to have an extraordinary impact. I don't know how often you've ever read the Bible, but if you are someone who reads the Bible regularly, and I hope and pray that a good number of us read the Bible regularly, when we read it, God can speak into our situation. Isn't that so true? If you've ever read the Bible if you're someone who reads the Bible regularly, you can say that. You know, I would say the Bible is the most powerful book on earth. Let me give you an illustration. A while back, I met a lady who attends a church in Brixton, South London, the Holy Land, because I grew up in South London, so I classify South London as a Holy Land. Although I'm going to Wales in June, and I'm now calling that the Holy Land. If I ever go to Israel, I might be calling that the Holy Land. But in her church, they had a desire to reach a particular tower block with John's Gospel. And every single flat was given a John's Gospel through the letterbox. It was a John's Gospel that at the back would have the address of the church, the telephone number, and also would have a, an insert on how can a person come to faith. So it simply would say... For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So each gospel that was put through each letterbox, the person from the church would pray, God use this. May it not be binned, may it not be set, put in the recycling, but may the person read it. And this particular person read it in this particular flat, this particular person was going through a hard time, going through depression, even thinking of suicide to the point of wanting to kill themselves that same day. And they read this John's Gospel and they came to faith that same day. They're on the verge of committing something quite drastic. And they read John's Gospel and God had mercy, opened this person's eyes. And why does this church member know this happened because the church received a phone call and to say I've just had a gospel of John put through my letterbox I've read it and I've now come to faith in Jesus and I, I would like to attend your church because that's the name on, on the address of the church and then this person shared that they were on the verge of finishing their life they were under so much pressure, so much stress, and they read God's, God's word, 
and God had a profound impact in, your, in her life. You know, we have a Bible that has an impact. We have a Bible that speaks into our situation. So I don't know what situation you may be going through right now. We're all different, aren't we? We all have come this morning with different experience this week. For some of us, it's been a really good time that we've gone through. Others of us, it's been so traumatic that simply getting out of bed to get here this morning has been an uphill task. But praise God you're here. And we hope and pray you'll carry on being here. And we find here in Nehemiah uh, chapter 9, an interesting comment by one theologian called Dick Hartfield, uh, an Australian Greek New Testament theologian, who says these words. The book of the law had been lost for 57 years, and now it's been found. Now, there are many theologians who would dis dispute the length of time that the book of the law had been lost. But all one thing that all these theologians agree with, A, the book of the law, the first five books of the Bible, had been lost, and now they're found. And also the other thing they all agree on, as the Bible is going to be read, extraordinary things are going to happen. So they can't agree how long the Bible's been lost for, but one thing they can agree on, that as this Bible is going to be read, God is going to move powerfully in those who are going to be hearing the Bible. So when you open up the Bible, the paper version, or the electronic version, or whatever version, well, they're the only two versions I can think of, that when we read it, it's God going to be speaking to you. And in verse 1 of Nehemiah chapter 9, we read how the Israelites are gathered together. So there's a sense of unity. They're together. The, the roof, I don't know why I've got roof on the brain. Do apologize. There's no roof involved. The only place that has a roof is Victoria Park Baptist Church. In fact, I was at a Baptist Union leaders meeting on Friday. And I told them I was from Victoria Park Baptist. And do you know what they said to me? You are the roof people. I said, well, <laughs> we are having a new roof. But I've never th thought of Victoria Park Baptist Church described as a roof people. I said, yes, we are getting a new roof. And in a few weeks' time, we will have a new roof. And we will not be described as a roof people. Because we will have a new roof. Isn't that so true, John? Yes, well, well, yes. And so we have a reputation. And here we find the Israelites are gathered together in verse 1. And they're doing something quite remarkable. The word of God has been read. They're now being challenged by God's word. That their lifestyle is not right and they need to change. And they're, in, they're fasting. What is fasting? It's simply to go without food. And to dedicate that time to seek God in prayer. And some people uh, fast quite often, others not so. But here in verse 1, they gather together fasting and wearing sackcloth and ashes. And you might think, what on earth is sackcloth and ashes? Well, the meaning of sackcloth and ashes is a symbol of mourning and repentance. And sackcloth, which I didn't realize until this week, was made of coarse hair from a goat and they sprinkled ashes as a symbol of repentance. And one theologian says this, the coarse hair that they were wearing was uncomfortable and not pleasant. And I thought, well, you don't need to be a genius to know that. If you're wearing uh, something from a goat, a goat's hair on you, it's not going to be very pleasant. But another theologian says something quite remarkable. It is an outward demonstration of what's happening inwardly. So they're seeking God. They've been convicted by God that what they've been doing is wrong. And they need to get right with God. But in verse 2 we read, the Israelites were separated themselves from all foreigners. Now what does that really mean? Well, it doesn't mean that if they were from an ethnic, different ethnic group, they wouldn't associate with them. But it describes that the, 
the believer is called to be holy. It is set, we are set apart to be holy people. And the word foreigner does not refer to people who are ethnically different, but those who are not believers. Because in this congregation this morning, we are from different parts of the world, aren't we? Some of us were born in London, like I was. I was born in UCH Hospital. But others of us were born in other parts of this country, other parts of Europe, and other parts of the world. But if we are believers in Jesus, we are, same, we are part of the same body. We are part of the same family, aren't we? You know, if the person next to you loves Jesus, then they are, they, they are your brother and they are your sister in the Lord. And that's a wonderful thing and a wonderful place to be. But in verse 3, I'm going to ask Hillary to, something's going to appear on the screen, as by magic, we don't use that word magic, but as a button. So we see in verse 3 something, they stood, so they're all standing, and they read from the book of the law, their God, a quarter of the day, so that's six hours, they spent the other six hours in confession, and in worshipping of the Lord. So they're all standing up. I'm not going to ask you to do so. And I'm certainly not going to ask you to stand up for six hours. Because there won't be anyone left. As I came this morning, Hillary said, Are you going to preach for four and a half hours? And I said, No, Hillary. I don't think the congregation... Well, I didn't say this to Hillary. But I don't think the congregation would stomach six, four and a half hour sermon. I can preach for four and a half hours, but I'm not going to preach for four and a half hours. And here they're standing, they're listening to the law of God, they're listening to God's word that had been lost and now it's found. How are you? How do you feel when you lose something and you find it? You know, we didn't have Kingfisher on Thursday. And we didn't have it because it was my fault. I lost my house keys and the church keys and I couldn't find them for four and a half hours. I was looking everywhere. Under the bed, under the pillows, in my pockets, everywhere. And I phoned to Sandy and said, Sandy, I, I, can't I can't come to Kingfisher. We're looking at Psalm 20. I can't find the house keys. But also, I can't find the church keys either. And it took, and I prayed about it, and it took me four and a half hours. And you know where the house keys were and, your, and the church keys were? Were in my wife's slippers. They'd fallen inside the slipper. And I was rejoicing when I found what was lost. And I phoned Sandy. I said, I found the keys of my house. It's not my house, it belongs to someone else. And I found the keys to the church. Panic over. And David this morning asked me about it, and I said it took me four and a half hours to find the church keys and my house keys. And lo and behold, they were... I even went into the bin, rummaging through all the rubbish, the neighbour's rubbish, my rubbish. I was filthy... So filthy that I had to put my clothes in the washing machine. So when you find something that's lost, you've, you are rejoicing. Especially if it's the house keys, your house keys and the church keys. <laughs> we, the only people we want to come into this building are those who are working on the roof. We don't want people who are not working on the roof to come into this building. So they're confessing their sins to God and they're worshipping the Lord. Uh, you can switch that slide off, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, not yet. That, that comes in a few minutes. But thank you so much for all your help, Hillary. So they stand to read the Bible. They're confessing their sins. They're worshipping God. I wonder when you read your Bible, or when I read my Bible, do we have a time of confessing what we've done wrong to God? Do we have a time when we read our Bibles of worshipping God, of thanking God? A few years ago, I met a man who said to me, Angel, I can't think of anything good that I can thank God for. My life is full of disappointments. My life is full of setbacks. I can't think of anything positive. And I said to this man, do me a favor, but do you... 
get a blank piece of paper. I will provide the paper and I will even provide a pencil. Not a pen, a pencil. And just ask God to help you to write down. And the following week I met him. He said, Angel, you know your idea of a piece of paper to thank God? I couldn't feel that piece of paper. But I've filled it six others. So sometimes we can't think of anything good to thank God for because we're so overwhelmed with pressure and stress and worry and anxiety. And I, I'm in that boat too sometimes. But when we pause to think, what can I thank God for? And we have a blank piece of paper and we say, God, bring to my memory things I can thank you for. And we can write it down. I wonder if you've ever done that exercise. I've done it many times. And it's amazing that we can thank God for. And hopefully there are more things we can thank God for than we could ever imagine. And here we find that only the Levites, the priests, are praising God. But in verse 5, they're standing up praising God, saying these words, who is everlasting. God is eternal. You know, I don't know how, how long any of us in this room will live for. Whether we'll live to reach 100 years or more or less, I don't know. But God is everlasting. And it says in verse 6, you, are alone, you alone are God. You made the heavens and the starry host. So in this chapter of 9, they're reading from the Old Testament. They're reading from the scriptures that they'd lost and now they're found. You know, maybe they were as excited as I was when I found the church keys and when I found my house keys. Well, maybe they were. And hopefully they were just as excited as I was. I was jumping up and down and dancing around the house. Because I was so stressed out for four and a half hours. And we did pray, as David said. David asked me this morning, but brother, did you pray? I said, yes, I did pray. I did pray, but it took four and a half hours. And uh, by the time I found the keys, it had gone 12 o'clock. And so, so there was no kingfisher. But this Thursday, David, we pray that we will not lose the keys. We pray that we, we will be able to open up kingfisher. But when you arrive about 9.40 or, or whatever time, a kingfisher starts at 10.30. Uh, but David is, is normally uh, prompt. So this is a great blessing. So in verse 6 it says, You alone are God. You made the heavens and the starry host. So they're declaring that God is eternal. And that God made the heavens and the stars. But also a reminder that God does want, not want any to be lost. Or C.H. Spurgeon says these words. When man sinned, God was willing enough to pardon him for the death of a sinner. He has no pleasure. So the God of the Bible does not want anyone to be lost. The God of the Bible has shown his love in sending Jesus Christ that we celebrate every, um, every Easter. And once a month we have communion in this church where we are commemorating and remembering the death of Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection. But C.A. Spurgeon says something quite interesting about the work of God in relationship to conviction. When I mean conviction, I don't mean you get nicked by the police and you go to court and you get sent down for five years or ten years. I'm not referring to that type of conviction. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When God convicts us that, what, what we, that, we are, that we've done something wrong, you know, when God convicts us that we've done something wrong, there's a reason that he convicts us of that. Because he wants us to change. He wants us to ask for forgiveness. He wants us to live a life that is pleasing to him. You know, God is not someone who just simply wants to point our faults in order to step on us. I don't know if you've ever met anyone like that, who will find your faults as an excuse to step on you, as an excuse to find the negative and just to condemn you. God's not like that. When God convicts us of sin, there's a reason. Because he wants us to change. He loves us so much that he wants us to live a life that is pleasing to him. C.H. Spurgeon says this, When a man's conscience is awakened, 
to the existence of sin that he cannot perceive a plea on his own ability, but only wisdom to seek God can help him. So what C.S. Spurgeon is saying in simple English is when someone's awakened to the fact that my sin, the bad things I've done, I can't change, but that leads me to call upon God for God to make a difference in my life. And he goes on to say this, to cast our burdens to God, that he is the great anchor of the faith. You know, what is an anchor? I don't know anything about shipping. I don't know anything, you know, when I go on a ferry, I get seasick. So I, I'm, I'm not, a, a, I live on an island, <laughs> but I, I avoid boats like the plague. I even struggle with uh, uh, flying on planes, but but here, an anchor, you, you, um, an anchor, a boat, you have an anchor, and it goes down onto the, I'm about to call it the soil, but the, uh, the depths of the ocean, ocean bed, to make sure that boat doesn't, it stays in place. And if our anchor is Jesus, then we will have something solid and a foundation that will hold us through the challenges of life. But the uncontrolled, but sin is something that here the people are asking for God's forgiveness and for cleansing. You know, what is sin? Well, sin is simply wrongdoing to fall short of God's standards. The Bible says for all we're, we're all like sheep that have gone astray. Each one of us has, laid, has gone our own way. So we're all sinners. But what is the impact of sin? Well, sin has been described as a, like a poison, a corrosive toxicity that is lethal. Sin has been described as something that if it doesn't get dealt with, it will spread like wildfire. And God was challenging the people as they were reading the scriptures that they need to get right with him and they were confessing their sins to God. You know, God points out things in our own lives that are not right, but for a reason. Because God knows everything about us. You know, nothing you've gone through this week, God is unaware of. The person sitting next to you may not know what you've gone through this week. I haven't got a clue what you've gone through this week. And you haven't got a clue. Well, you, yes, you do, because I told you about losing the keys. So you do know a little bit of what I went through on Thursday. The kittens I was having, and the panic, and, uh, and the stress, and... and and the key was in my wife's slippers. And that's, uh, I should have checked there. And uh, I checked everywhere else, but not there. And here that they're confessing their sins to God. And, and they're seeking God. And they're seeking a, to follow God. Is that a description of you this morning? That when you open up the Bible, that God speaks to you. And God ministers into your situation. And that God is a God who keeps his promise. In verse 8, it says, you made a covenant, talking God's covenant with Abraham. And it says, you keep your promise. I love that word. I love that word when it describes God as a God who keeps his promise. I don't know about you, but what I need is to have a God who keeps his word, to have a God who keeps his promises. You know, if you have a friend, and I, hopefully we all have friends. N no? Yes? Yeah, I can see one smiling face here. A few here people aren't smiling. I don't know. Are oh, they not smiling because they ain't, ain't got any friends? Or are they not smiling because you can smell the, uh, the lovely cake and you said, oh, I want the service to finish now because I'm going to have lovely cake. Now, I don't know what's under there, but I'm sure it's going to be lovely coffee's lovely, the cakes are lovely, and the company is lovely. And here it says in Joshua 21 verse 45, not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. We have a God who keeps his promises. We have a God who does not lie, a God who has a plan for each one of our lives. And that's so important to hold on to. Because life at times can be very unpredictable. Isn't that so true? Who would have imagined the war in Ukraine? And thank you for collecting um, 
the cans and the tins and the, and the food and the nappies and all the things that the Russian-speaking Baptist church in Milan is going to send to Moldova to use with refugees in, in Ukraine. So please do carry on. But who would have imagined there would have been a war in Ukraine? Who would have imagined that um, um, all the prices in our shops would have gone up so high? Who would have imagined the, the price of electricity would have gone up and the price of gas and the utilities would all go up? You know, we live in such an unpredictable world where things can change so easily without any concept. And who would have imagined that I would have lost the house keys and the church keys on Thursday morning? But I've got them here. See? Someone said I should tie them round my neck. I'm not sure if they meant that in a positive way. <laughs> Hopefully they did. But you know, life can happen, or things can happen that are beyond our understanding or control. And, it's, and here we find... That they're reminded that God keeps his word. That God is one. And in verse 9 it says, You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry in the Red Sea. That's a reference to Exodus chapter 3 verse 7. And it goes on to say, God sees the suffering of his people and he's proactive. I, I love that. It's making a reference to Exodus 17, verse 13. You know, God sees the suffering of his people. You know, I don't know what suffering you might be going through right now. It might be a lot more serious than losing the house keys and, and losing the church keys. I'm sure the treasurer wouldn't be too happy if I lost the church keys. But, but we, we found them. Don't worry, Hillary. So there's no need to change the locks of the church. So don't worry, and the London City Mission don't have to worry of changing the locks of a house in Islington where we live in. But God sees the suffering of his people and he's proactive. In verse 10 we read, You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and against all of his officials and, all, and the people in the land, for you knew how arrogantly of the Egyptians had treated them. So if you know anything about Exodus 7 to 13, it's all the miracles all the signs and wonders that God was displaying in Egypt in order that the Israelites would be set free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And God had a plan to bring rescue and deliverance to, to his people. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, so get ready Hillary, we're getting very close. It says, God parted the Red Sea, that's a reference to Exodus 14, 21. When it says, you divided the sea before them, and they passed through onto dry ground. But you hurled the pursuers into the depths, like the stone of the mighty waters. So here they're reading from the scriptures that had been lost. They're reading from Exodus. The people have been asking for, for forgiveness from God, because God brought conviction upon them. And it goes on to say here, verse 13, for, for God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. That's a reference to Exodus 19, verse 11. Verse 13 of, of Nehemiah 9 says this, You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them the regulations and the laws that are just and right, and the decrees and the commandments that are good. You know, I don't know how often you've opened up the Bible. Maybe you're someone who doesn't open the Bible very often. Maybe, you, maybe you're someone like someone I met a few years ago says, the Bible helps me sleep at night. And I said, hallelujah, you're reading the Bible before you go to bed. And he said, can I take you into my bedroom? I thought, <laughs> wait a moment. <laughs> what you want? Why does a man want to take me into his bedroom? But I, I went in very slowly and he said, can you go under the bed? I said, what? <laughs> this, are you, are you, are you, what, what, what do you want? He said, look under the bed. What can you see? I see, I see three legs. What do you see in the far end? He says, you haven't got a leg. You've, you've got a big, huge Bible instead of a leg. He said, yes, the Bible helps me sleep at night because it balances the bed. 
And I said, I take back what I said. The Bible is not meant for you to use it as a balancing weight on your bed. The Bible is there for us to read it. So I hope there's no one here in Victoria Park Baptist Church that has a Bible at home that they just use it to, for, for, um, for, um, for balance their bed or they just use it as a doorstop because they can't find a doorstop. And here they're reading the Bible. Here they're having an impact. But what do we learn from history? You know, the Israelites are commanded to, to remind themselves what God has done. In Psalm 78 verse 4 it says, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and his wonders he has done. You know, I love Sunday school. And why do I love Sunday school? I'm not a Sunday school teacher, so don't, don't get excited. But I love Sunday school because in Sunday school... It's an opportunity to teach children, the next generation, what the Bible teaches. Isn't that so true? You know, if you have children, whether you're a mum or a dad, or you're a, a grandmother or grandfather, or, or you have an opportunity to, to teach the next generation something from God's Word. And Sunday school is so precious because it's teaching children God's Word. And I want to close... And Hillary, in a moment, not yet, not yet, is going gonna, is gonna to put something on the screen. But I want to close by saying this. Years ago, I used to visit a nursing home. And it had people with dementia and Alzheimer's. I don't know if you've ever come across anyone with dementia and Alzheimer's towards the end of my own uh, uh, mother's life, who sadly my mother died a year ago. Um, she was suffering from uh, um, a degree of dementia to the point that she couldn't recognize her own son, which was me, which was very painful as a son when your own mum doesn't recognize you. That's heartbreaking. But it, I used to visit this nursing home with dementia. And the residents, I would tell them my name. And within 30 seconds, they would forget my name. And, they, and I was being asked 20 times what my name was. And they kept on forgetting. And I didn't really care. I don't care if you forget my name. But the wonderful thing that I saw in that nursing home, that some of these older people who had gone to Sunday school, who had been taught the Bible as children, they could remember Bible truths. And I was so glad. My heart was overjoyed. I don't care that you forget my name. I don't care if you think I'm the cleaner. I don't care if you think I'm from the local council. I don't care if you think... I'm your lost, lost cousin from, I don't know, whatever. But the fact that they could remember the Bible. So our ma mind is quite amazing. God is quite amazing. That God can enable us to forget things or remember things. And the final... Um, Hillary, th thank you. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you, Hillary. So the final verse... It's a description of the people. They refuse to listen and fail to remember the miracles you performed among them. Hopefully, none of us will be like that. That as you write down the things that God has done in your life, as you write down the wonderful things, and when we get a new roof, it'll be an opportunity of thanking God. That new roof will be in place this year. I can guarantee, well, no, I can't guarantee anything. It will hopefully be in place this year. And when we can remember, hopefully we will not be like those who refuse to listen and fail to remember the miracles God has done. You know, as human beings, we sometimes have a long memory for certain things and a short memory for other things, don't we? We can have a long memory when things have gone bad and we have a whole list but we sometimes can have a short memory. My prayer is that we, each one of us, God will bring to our memories that computer in our brains of all the good things that he has done. And the final verse, and this is a description of God. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, 
slow to anger and abounding in love. And a reminder of that, therefore you did not desert them. I'm not sure if it's meant to have two S's or one. I don't know. My grammar's atrocious. You know, God doesn't abandon you. God will never wash his hands off you. God won't do a Pontius Pilate on you. And what's a Pontius Pilate? Washed his hands of Jesus. So God has a plan for each single one of us this morning. And God, may you take opportunity today. Hit the iron when it's hot. Not literally, because you'll burn yourself. But hit it hot of writing down of things that you can remember that God has helped you with. Let's just pray. You can pray with your eyes open or closed, it doesn't matter. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to, to meet together as a body of believers here in Victoria Park Baptist Church. We pray, Lord God, that you will remind each one of us of verse 17, that may we learn to be those who listen to you, Lord. May we be those who do not fail to remember your miracles. I pray, almighty God, that right now, we're aware we are sat, you will bring to our memory things of our lives, things that have happened to us recently in which we can thank you for. For Lord God, we, we all have a short memory, including myself. I can so easily dwell on the things that don't go well. I can so easily dwell on setbacks and disappointments and heartbreak. But help me to have a balance also, to be those who seek you, to those who can thank you. And we thank you, almighty God, for the final verse in verse 17 that reminds us of the character of God. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them. And Lord God, we take, enable us to believe this afternoon that you will not desert us, that you will not abandon us. So whatever challenges we face in the new week, starting from today onwards, pray that you'll remind us that you are there with us and you have a plan for each single one of us. In Jesus' name we pray.